thank you everyone uh, for joining us. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeff Holmes, which who the Dean of the School of Engineering, who's gonna give us a brief welcome and then I will introduce Dr. Tyler. Thanks, Lynn. Hi, I'm Jeff Holmes. I'm the new Dean of Engineering. I've been able to meet some of you, but not all of you yet since, uh, since I started. So looking forward to continuing to make my way around campus. Uh, and very excited um, for the engineering school uh, about neuroengineering. This is the main strategic focus for us moving forward. And uh, great to see this seminar series getting off the ground. Really happy to welcome Jamie back uh, virtually to UEB as our first speaker. And I'll, I'll hand it over to Lynn for the formal introduction. Okay, great. Well, I would like to also welcome everyone to the first seminar, of the new UAB Neuroengineering Seminar Series, hosted by the new UAB Neuroengineering and Brain Computer Interface Initiative. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jamie Tyler as the first speaker in this new series. Uh, Dr. Tyler did both his undergrad and his doctoral studies at UAB. He received a Bachelor of Science in Psychology and then received a PhD in Behavioral Neuroscience working in the lab of Dr. Lucas Pozo Miller. He next went to Harvard University for his postdoctoral fellowship, where he worked in the lab of Dr. Becky Murphy. He entered the ranks of academia as an assistant professor, first in the Department of Neurobiology and Bioimaging at Arizona State, and then went to Virginia Tech University, where he was an assistant professor of biomedical engineering. In 2014, he returned to Arizona State as an associate professor with tenure in biological and health systems engineering. Dr. Tyler is a global leader in the field of neurotechnology and non-invasive neuromodulation. He has extensive expertise in the development of non-invasive neuromodulation devices using ultrasound and high frequency bioelectronics to enhance brain health and human performance in both healthy people and patients with neurological or neuropsychiatric disorders. His work has been supported by a wide range of grants, including multiple grants from DARPA, the NIH, NSF, and DOD. He has published an extensive list of scientific articles in top journals, given keynote lectures at universities and conferences around the world, and won a number of awards throughout his career. These awards include an award as the UAB Outstanding Student in Behavioral Neuroscience during his time here, and also the Academic Innovator of the Year Award in 2010, uh, to name just two of his many awards. He's a true neuroengineer, having combined a successful career, successful academic career with a successful and entrepreneurial career. He is a holder of more than 20 patents with many more uh, patent applications pending and has successfully started multiple companies. Uh, in addition to being well known within academia, his work has received a lot of attention among lay audiences. For example, his work on vagal nerve stimulation for sports performance enhancement was featured in an ESPN Films docuseries. And his work on transcranial focused ultrasound for brain circuit modulation was featured on the History Channel's program, In Search Of. I could go on, but I'll stop there and let Dr. Tyler give his talk, which is titled Neuroengineering Methods and Devices for Enhancing Plasticity and Brain Health. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so I think I advanced to the disclosures already on accident, and I can't figure out how to go backwards. So uh, without further ado, I do have disclosures. I'm the founder of a company, um, <clears throat> IST. Um, and uh, another company via IST, Diamond Therapeutics. And so we work on uh, multiple neuromodulation uh, devices. And then Diamond Therapeutics is a uh, psychedelic medicine company based in Toronto, Canada. Um, so let me see if I can figure this out now. Okay, so I'm gonna talk to you about neuromodulation. And um, in particular, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, ultrasonic neuromodulation and electrical neuromodulation, uh, non-invasive. Uh, electrical neuromodulation. I think with this audience, it's, I probably don't have to belabor the point of what is neuromodulation. Uh, generally, we refer to neuromodulation as being in one of two uh, classes. One is invasive neuromodulation, and this consists of surgically implanted neurostimulators, such as spinal cord stimulation devices, deep brain stimulation devices, and uh, invasive cervical vagus nerve stimulation devices. Non-invasive modalities include transcranial magnetic stimulation, transcranial focused ultrasound, and then other transdermal methods <clears throat> um, such as transcr 
transdermal and transcutaneous vagus nerve stimulation. So I've been <clears throat> interested in um, developing approaches uh, that were not based on methods that we had. So when I trained in Lucas's lab, that was kind of the, the beginning of optogenetics and, and Carl Dizeroth and Ed Boyd and others had started to work in optogenetics and I saw the entire world moving that direction. And um, <clears throat> really born out of work in Lucas's lab that I've described before um, at UAB, that, I had an interest in how mechanical forces affected synaptic transmission and plasticity. And so when I got to Arizona State University, I uh, quickly developed methods uh, using pulse ultrasound to modulate uh, brain activity based on the idea that uh, the brain is a mechanically sensitive organ, right? So brain tissue is viscoelastic. It's a non-Newtonian fluid. It's a media that's ideally suited to propagate and transmit mechanical waves and ion channels are mechanically sensitive. And that was the basis of the idea. 12 years ago, it was a crazy idea. And people, you know, were like, look, this is, this is, you know, you can't use, it was kind of like you were talking to someone, a, a neuropsychiatric patient, if you were talking about using ultrasound to remotely control someone's brain activity. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a story about where that world has come, how it's evolved, and then I'm going to talk about vagus nerve stimulation, the last bit of the talk. So low intensity, low frequency ultrasound, um, this we used uh, optogenetic probes and um, as well as organic calcium indicators and sodium indicators uh, <clears throat> to first show in 2008 that we could modulate brain activity in organotypic slice cultures, acute slices, um, and ex vivo brain preparations. <clears throat> um, I was then contacted by Bill Newsom at Stanford University who asked me about the methods and whether we could, um, whether we could induce the phosphine in the visual cortex of a monkey, right? And so we had tried for a long time to get this work from, uh, to translate from a, a slice to an animal unsuccessfully. And then when I got the phone call from Bill, I was like, oh, I just have to build an acoustic collimating column and just put a beam of ultrasound on the skull, right? And so this is kind of where this work came from and where it went. We did that. We showed with a, a simple acoustic collimating column uh, that we could transmit ultra, ultrasound into the uh, head of intact animals and modulate brain activity. We then <clears throat> uh, published a paper, uh, proof of principle paper, showing that in a model of uh, status epilepticus, uh, epilepsy in animals, using canic acid to induce epilepsy, our uh, ele electrographic seizures, um, we showed that we could immediately reduce and suppress seizure activity in those animals. Um, and that was really kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy because at that time it was understood that anything that could modulate brain activity should also be able to jam certain types of epilepsy, right? Um, so, we then went on, I wanted to translate uh, into working in humans. Um, so I found that a company was funded by uh, <clears throat> the US Army to work on post-traumatic pain. That company was subsequently spun into another company um, that became known as Think. Uh, we did a lot of animal safety testing. So I worked in pigs. I did a lot of work with CROs um, to test our methods in pigs. I went to Kenya, flew to Kenya and recorded from deep brain regions of baboons in the jungle in Kenya. Um, uh, to show that we were being able to modulate the activity of the reticular formation. Um, that was actually an interesting institute. It's also the place, the Institute for Primate Research in Kenya is where they did a lot of the early work on the placenta transplant. I mean, not the placenta, the uterus transplant, right? And so it's kind of fascinating to see some of that uh, and how it happens in a, a different country. <clears throat> um, we had a grant with Dora Sal, um, a McKnight Foundation grant, uh, Innovation in Neuroscience grant and showed with her that we could affect brain activity via myon contrast imaging. So it's kind of it's similar to fMRI, but using a contrast agent. Um, and so then we took that data and while I was at Virginia Tech, we went to the IRB and we had done another experiment I'll talk about later where we combined ultrasound and MRI uh, with EEG to demonstrate safety of the three combination, the combination of the three together. Um, but we started human research and we showed that we could modulate the activity of somatosensory cortex in humans that resulted in a behavioral change, right? So we were able to suppress activity in somatosensory cortex that led to a functional increase in somatosensory discrimination. The major win here was that we were able to show that uh, the spatial resolution was sub-centimeter, 
right? And we were able to move, what we did is we moved the beam, the focus ultrasound beam, either one centimeter anterior or posterior to the target site in S1, and we lost the effect, right? So the effects on EEG went away. Um, <clears throat> that work really, we did a lot of acoustic test tank method, methods and, you know, people weren't familiar with like, first, could you, can you focus ultrasound? And the answer is yes, you can, right? And SciTech and others have shown that with high intensity focus ultrasound. It, in, a, in, a, in a linear regime, it's just wave physics, right? And so it's a, you know, you can focus waves, constructive interference, deconstruct them. Um, so using phased arrays to control the electrical timing of the propagation of the ultrasound from the transducer through the skull, and you can correct for phase distortions uh, if you need to, you can get a focus ultrasound beam that is as small if not smaller than the electric field, the spatial distribution of the electric field that's generated by a deep brain stimulating electrode. Okay, and that's what's shown in this graph. So this is work from one of my postdocs, Wen Lagong, when he was at uh, University of Minnesota, showed that he can modulate the intact thalamus in humans. Um, and this is the spatial profile of the beam, and you can see it as a waist, uh, full width, half max uh, of about five millimeters. And then here you can see this is the spatial distribution modeled of the electric field from a standard DBS electrode, a multi-site DBS electrode. And you can see that the spatial distribution of the electric field kind of at the peak, not even the peak, probably about 70% of the peak is about four millimeters, right? So you're on the order of what you can do, but non-invasively from outside the brain. And this is effectively how it works to treat essential tremor and Parkinson's disease. It's just the intensity that you put in this spot to burn the brain is about 800 watts per centimeter squared compared to about 20 watts per centimeter squared or less for modulating activity. Um, others have gone on to replicate the work. That was, I kind of stepped away from this field for a while to work on vagus nerve stimulation and trigeminal nerve stimulation um, based on some other work we were doing. Uh, but other laboratories started to show that you could indeed modulate the activity of human visual cortex, human thalamus, you could do multi, this is, you know, nice work, multi-site uh, stimulation to stimulate motor cortex and somatosensory cortex at the same time. You can integrate focus ultrasound transducers with TMS coils, right? And so every, essentially every combination had been shown by others in the field uh, up through about 2016, 2017. Um, ongoing safety analysis. So the question is, is it safe? We've now accumulated data from several different groups around the world. And there's review papers that are written on this in terms of the animal safety, because this has been tried in essentially every animal model you could imagine now, um, in, as well as in vitro preparations. And so Robin Cleveland's group and others in, in the UK have, have published papers on the safety in animal models. And then when Legone's group has done a lot of uh, safety analysis, retrospective safety analysis from patients that they ran in different studies and have shown that the side effects of transcranial focus ultrasound are essentially equivalent to or less than those that are uh, experienced with TDCS or TACS and TMS, these other non-invasive neuromodulation modalities. Um, there's still a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of inherent risk. You are dealing with high voltage transformers, right? You have mechanical, like if these transducers, they're epoxy together, they're layered. So there's certain safety precautions. There's a working group that's been formed now um, backed by, it's, it's sponsored essentially by the FDA, NIH, and the Focus Ultrasound Surgery Foundation. Uh, it's called iTrust. It's an international group of the kind of the top neuromodulation uh, groups in the world to make safety recommendations and kind of standard operating procedures, best practices in this space for modulation of brain activity using focus ultrasound. How does it work? Um, it's very similar. So others have now gone on to show what we originally showed that uh, ultrasound modulates the activity of voltage gated ion channels. This is work from Jan Kubinik, who uh, is at the University of Utah now and was at Stanford University. Stanford's built an entire, several universities have built entire centers around focused ultrasound now. Um, but he showed that you could non-invasively modulate um, TREK1 channels uh, as well as uh, NAV1.5 uh, voltage-gated sodium channels uh, in a reversible manner using focused ultrasound. Uh, Mikhail Shapiro's group, uh, Mikhail's at Caltech and is, is a, he's become a real leader in the field in terms of some of the probes he's been developing in this space. Um, but this is work that I believe this may have been published now. This is from, a, I think, the bioarchive article they had. Uh, showing that you can modulate, uh, ultrasound can modulate the activity of uh, mechanosensitive calcium channels, 
leading to a, what he refers to as a calcium accumulation and then ion channel amplification, where you basically have these recurrent calcium waves that occur in cells and can cause them to undergo uh, activity bursting. And some of that seems to be mediated through trip channels. Um, the, uh, another group, like Sun's group has shown that ultrasound uh, modulates the activity of piezo one, which is a mechanically sensitive channel um, that's become very interesting in terms of its role in touch and itch and many other um, uh, actions in the, in the CNS. Um, and what was interesting about this paper is not only did they show that they had a primary effect on the ion channels, piezo one, they showed that there were downstream effects in terms of uh, modulation of uh, phosphocam kinase and CFOS um, and other uh, PCREB. So other basically downstream targets of channel activity showing that it's not just some phenomenon that happens isolated at the level of uh, membrane, uh, but it has downstream consequences. And that has been further kind of expanded upon um, by Justin Lee's group uh, showing that ultrasound can modulate the activity of astrocytic trip A1 channels and then that via this best one mediated glutamate release can activate and modulate the activity of NMDA receptors. And that this could be one of the mechanisms of plasticity. <clears throat> um, so it's been consistent across groups that you can modulate the activity of channels. One of the big questions has been, is there anything that's analogous to optogenetics? That is, could you identify channels that have certain mechanosensitivities to certain frequencies of ultrasound? And the short answer to that is yes. Um, so Shrek Chelasani's group at the Salk Institute has uh, developed sonogenetics. Um, this, is a, this paper is from a few years ago. They showed that they can induce a novel behavior in C. elegans by expressing a mechanosensitive uh, trip four channel in neurons that didn't natively express it. Uh, so it's using a native channel expressed in a neuron that doesn't normally express the channel. But what's really interesting is they had um, DARPA funding to continue to work on this. And my former grad student went to work with Shrek on this. And what they started doing is just like optogenetics, they started getting channels from nature. And so this is from a mimosa plant. There's a channel that regulates osmotic stress. Um, so you've seen these plants, you go touch them and the leaves fold. It basically, it's activation of a mechanical channel that regulates osmotic stress in the plant. And so they've now started to clone those channels out of these organisms into mammalian expression vectors. And so I think it's going to be very interesting. Can you start to develop a library or database of, you can imagine, extremely mechanosensitive channels and then some channels that are not as mechanosensitive? Um, so it's, it's, it's going to be very interesting how this plays out. Um, so current translational progress uh, driven by other like industry. This is, the, this is kind of the holy grail in some sense right now of uh, non-invasive functional neurosurgery, if there is such a thing, right? So I think if you talk to most functional neurosurgeons, a functional neurosurgeon is actually implanting devices into the head of someone, you know, like DBS electrodes, mapping brain regions with electrodes. And SciTech has been working for a long time on technology known as HIFU or MR-guided high-intensity focused ultrasound. So the way this procedure works is you have a patient goes into a, a, an array of, of uh, transducers, a thousand transducers, their head fits inside of a latex gasket. Cold water recirculates over their scalp because the skull heats up a, a lot. Um, and then using reverse timing algorithms and calculating the bone density from a CT scan, they can correct for phase aberrations and precisely focus 800 watts or even more to the center mass of an individual's brain. Right? And so what you can then do is mechanically position the individual in the beam of focus and then modulate the phase uh, distortion a little bit and uh, thermally ablate targets. And so this is now approved in all states, all 50 states for treatment of a central tremor. Parkinson's disease is, is another you know, indication um, that, that is looking promising. So people have been playing around with thalamotomy and pallidotomy and even cingulotomy. So basically uh, cutting the, the, the corpus callosum um, is another procedure that's being investigated for neuropsychiatric disorders, right? The problem is they have to use MR thermography to see where the beam is, right? So they have to heat the brain up to localize the beam. What they'd like to do is be able to map the area that they're going to functionally remove from the brain to treat the disease. Um, and to do that, you would need low intensity ultrasound. And so this is work from Jeff Elias's group at the University of Virginia. 
and Charlottesville. And what they did is they took the, the inside tech machine and they, they changed the inside tech machine to deliver low intensity pulses instead of a continuous wave um, ultrasound waveform. And you can see in the top, there's no heating of the target. And in the bottom with high food, there you can see heating of the target. And then they went in and showed with the low intensity focus ultrasound, they can map the thalamus. And so the idea is you stereotactically map the thalamus with focus ultrasound prior to the ablation, right? And, and it may not be obvious, but there's no contrast by MRI. And so the sensory thalamus is right next to the motor, motor thalamus. If you want to ablate the motor thalamus, you don't want to accidentally be in the sensory thalamus, right? And so you need to identify where you are. The way they do that now is they talk to the patients and the patients will get paresthesia or they may have like the tremor will stop um, temporarily. And so they functionally map it, but they're doing it with heating, right? And so hopefully this will, this will pan out in terms of functional brain mapping with, uh, with focused ultrasound. <clears throat> uh, Sasha Bostritsky's group and Mark George um, have been working on treating pain. They've also had a couple of papers on treating individuals in minimally conscious states, um, which have been very interesting. Um, and so th this is work from Mark George's, Mark George's group showing that they could non-invasively modulate the thalamus with low intensity focus ultrasound and shift uh, mechano and thermosensory thresholds, right? So they're actually looking at modulating nociceptive thresholds by focusing on uh, delivering focus ultrasound to the thalamus. Ben He's group also is, has gotten into the space now. So Ben uh, is now the chair of BME at Carnegie Mellon, and he's built a pretty strong center around focus ultrasound and focus ultrasound uh, uh, combined with ultrasound imaging um, in collaboration with uh, Pittsburgh. So they're also working on pain um, and they're working on using focus ultrasound combined with ultrasound imaging for brain computer interfaces. So Stores Medical um, is a company in Austria that they're in they're in multiple countries. They basically have developed a, a shockwave therapies for a long time. They started a couple of years ago treating patients with a, a shockwave. It's a, it's a broadband ultrasound stimulus. They started treating patients with Alzheimer's disease and have shown significant improvements in terms of memory scores. So this in, this is actually a very interesting case for us. Uh, we just got a, a seed grant to do to basically replicate these phonics with patients from the Mayo Clinic. Um, but I think this is when you look at <clears throat> where people are, what people are doing now with, I'm not going to talk a lot about drug delivery, but people are using uh, the ability to focus ultrasound combined with contrast agents to disrupt the blood brain barrier. And then when you do that, you can actually deliver drugs to the hippocampus, for example. So whether that's antibodies or some other drug. Um, so using focus ultrasound for drug delivery also is like when you look at what's happening with uh, Alzheimer's disease, it's interesting. There's another story too that's in this space. There's a group in Australia that they recently got a $10 million grant to do the same study on um, Alzheimer's patients. Their mechanism of action is a little bit different. So they believe that they're causing a microglia reaction, right? So they're actually inducing a small microglia response with the focus ultrasound. So what they do is they non-invasive, they open the blood brain barrier and don't deliver any drugs. And they think that that opening of the blood brain barrier causes an inflammatory response. And that is the mechanism of action for some of the plasticity that's observed subsequently, at least in patients with Alzheimer's. We started working. So this was when I was at Virginia Tech. I had the company uh, Neurotrack that became Think. This is the first device that we built. Um, it was actually a, this is a focus ultrasound transducer and there's some challenges with focus ultrasound and the way the ultrasound behaves and uh, was transmitted from a transducer. You don't really have a nice uniform field set up in what's called the near field versus the far field. And so we developed a transducer that had a convex concave lens. So you can focus ultrasound using lenses too, right? You just use different materials instead of glass, you use graphite or some other material. <clears throat> and then you can build a lens because you know, you, it's, you're just, it's a lensing effect, right? So we had a convex concave lens that was epoxied together to allow us to focus to the cortex. <clears throat> and then we had this box that was pretty cool that had a, a little touchscreen interface that you could code it for placebo delivery um, and, and do many different waveforms. We built this for Stuart Hameroff, who was an anesthesiologist at the University of Arizona, because Stuart was running trials. He would literally go get the ultrasound machine from the operating room and wheel it into a room and run it on undergraduate students who would visit the hospital. 
And so I was like, Stuart, let us build a device and then sponsor research with you and see if it works out. So <clears throat> we call it the hammer off waveform. Um, but what we showed was that you could modulate uh, network activity um, of the default mode network using ultrasound and there was a correlation with improvement in mood. <clears throat> And so then we ran a study that was a double blinded study in patients who had uh, worry, right? So when you think about depression is a, is a rumination disorder, it's worry and thought preoccupation with the past, right? Anxiety is worry and thought and, and preoccupation with the future. And so it's with rumination disorders, we found that this can disrupt some of the rumination aspects of depression and so we plan on taking this forward clinically, either working ourselves with a company and collaborators that I'll talk about in a minute or some others. Um, but we think that this is the, the path to start getting to replacing or improving what things like transcranial magnetic stimulation can do today, because we can reach deeper brain targets. So this is an example of, so my average, I just had a PhD student finish up um, late last year. She worked on modulating uh, the insula and the anterior cingulate cortex. And so these experiments are neuro navigation guided. We have MRIs from each subject that comes into the study. And then we use an optical neuro navigation system combined with, in this case, with 64 channel EEG. And the subject then undergoes an emotional, they, they do an emotional flanker task, right? And so what we found in that study is that we could modulate, depending on if we're in the dorsal ACC or the insula, we could differentially modulate um, something called the error potential, as well as uh, the emotional response or cognitive control, right? And so this gets to the, the when you look at the anterior cingulate cortex, it's a very interesting target for mental health disorders. We just submitted a grant to NSF, uh, one of their neurocognitive systems uh, foundations grants uh, to map the, the cingulate cortex and look at different targets such as the posterior cingulate cortex, the anterior cingulate cortex and different nodes within the default mode network circuitry to identify the brain targets that will allow us to most effectively and most robustly modulate kind of affect response. The error potentials are very interesting because what's essentially happening there is your brain knows that you've made an error, right? And so a lot of, we use mismatch negativity in a lot of our studies and people will think about mismatch negativity um, in terms of uh, your, your brain makes a prediction error, right? And that causes anxiety. And because your, your brain's response is a stress response that there was an error, right? And so <clears throat> honing in on, on whether there's a way to, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about EEG biomarkers for depression, right? I don't know that there's an EEG biomarker for depression. That's a very hard thing to characterize. But when we look at reflexive signatures, right? So we, we like mismatch negativity, P50 suppression that are kind of the brain's natural automatic reflex to a stimulus, the stimulus response, if you will. Um, we think that's the way to start to develop biometrics for these neuropsychiatric indications. You're not gonna look at alpha power or gamma power and be able to tell if someone's gonna be responsive to a neurostimulation. It has to be stimulus response and it has to touch on emotional stimulus response. So we're very excited about where these studies are gonna go. Um, development of turnkey solutions. This is a big problem, right? And this is one of the things I remember, one of the lessons learned at UAB and at Harvard when I was in Vicki Murthy's lab was, you build these microscopes and these rigs that are kind of one-offs. And when your postdocs or grad students leave, the rig's just kind of sitting there and no one knows how to code it or use it, or it's got a computer that's five years old. And so turnkey systems, like they make science go fast, right? Because I need the person who's working on solving the problem, not to worry about the gear they're solving the problem with, but to worry about the problem. And so we had realized that because we did the same thing with focus ultrasound. It was a there was nothing made for focus ultrasound off the shelf, right? Like we had to cobble these things together with these, these class A linear amplifiers and data acquisition cards and EEGs. And then <clears throat> the transducers were a whole different ball game because you're working with every, we worked with every company we could find to have them custom make transducers for us so that we had the acoustic properties of the transducers, the focus and characteristics, the, the ability to transmit a certain amount of power without the thing blowing apart, um, and then adding on neuro navigation. So I, um, I worked on a, my company did a deal with another company, I'll talk about it in a few minutes, um, a couple of years ago, and we uh, had some revenues from that. And then we, I reinvested um, 
into creating a brand uh, that we call Neuroplus, neuromodulation by focus ultrasound. And so I did a licensing deal with Sonic Concepts and said, look, I want it to look like TMS, feel like TMS, but be better than TMS, right? And so that was the, the kind of the product specifications, if you will. Um, and so this is now our turnkey system. We launched it in late 2019 at the Society for Neuroscience meeting, the last real live neuroscience meeting that there was. Um, and uh, we've done quite well. This is now, it's been distributed in multiple countries throughout the world, probably eight or nine countries. It's distributed by Brainbox in Europe and Sonic Concepts. But what we wanna do is we wanna, we wanna disrupt the transcranial magnetic stimulation world, which is ripe for innovation, right? You have all these companies, MagStim, Neurostar, Brainsway is a little bit different. They claim to have deep brain uh, TMS, um, but for the most part, they're technologically pretty flat. They'll make every shape of magnetic coil you want and give you every explanation in the world about how that shape is gonna affect brain activity in a different way. But fundamentally, they don't have anything that can target at a high spatial resolution deep in the brain, right? And so going directly after those indications, uh, depression being number one is a very high priority target for us now um, in, in advancing this Neuro, NeuroPlus platform. And whether we do that ourselves as the group of companies I just showed you, um, or we do that with some other companies is kind of to, to be determined right now in terms of real time conversations and negotiations. Um, the bioelectronic medicine space, right? So this is a space that has exploded driven largely by uh, Kevin Tracy's work showing that vagus nerve stimulation can reduce cytokine, cytokine production. Um, what it does do when you stimulate the vagus, it also causes cardiac side effects, right? So bradycardia, you can disrupt uh, baroreceptors and so, um, DARPA funded work uh, at GE, Medtronic, the University of Minnesota, and those papers came out a couple years ago. This is part of the electrics program at DARPA. Um, and what they showed is that you can actually modulate this cholinergic inflammatory pathway using focus ultrasound the same way that you can with electrical stimulation, but you do not get the cardiac side effects, okay? And so that's a really big deal because you can now, like these ultrasound transducers, you can take what's called a capacitive micromachined ultrasound transducer or a PMUT, a piezo micromachined ultrasound transducer and put something called an ASIC, an application specific integrated circuit on the back of the transducer and then power it with low power and implant it in the body if you want, right? The goal, you don't want to do that, but you can imagine making a nerve cuff out of ultrasound transducers that are very high frequency transducers and get very, very high spatial resolution and down to the tens of microns, right? Um, so what they showed in this paper is they could modulate the activity of this cholinergic pathway when they activated the, the splanchnic nerve. Um, so when they stimulated the spleen, uh, they would actually get these neural junctions where they got release of norepinephrine and that's what kicks off this, uh, this cholinergic um, in inflammatory pathway. When they modulated the liver, they changed glucose metabolism, right? And so then they went on to show in OB, OB mice, these ob obese mice and DBDB mice, the diabetic mice, um, that they can modulate outcomes that would lead you to believe that this, is, this has got high therapeutic potential. And so Medtronic did the same thing in collaboration with the University of Minnesota and Hubert Lim's group. And what they showed is that um, you could use the same type of thing. So modulating here, um, this cholinergic inflammatory pathway, instead of using electrical vagus nerve stimulation, modulating the spleen directly, you're activating the neural junctions that are innervating the spleen. And they use this to treat animal models of rheumatoid arthritis, right? So an autoimmune condition um, and so they're basically running human trials on this now. Um, we have done work on the somatosensory periphery before because I'm interested in communications and brain machine interfaces. There's a company uh, known as Ultra Haptics. Uh, Disney actually has a technology called Air Real, A I R R E A L. It's mid air haptics, right? So your body responds to um, mechanical forces and you can propagate and transmit those mechanical forces in a focused manner through air. It just happens to be air transmitted ultrasound, right? So you have converging and diverging waves. And so you can focus ultrasound in midair. Just, it just, it, all, all, sound doesn't like to travel through air like it does in water, um, but that can be overcome. And so this has become interesting because now you can, the technology exists and this sounds scientific fiction, but it's real. 
you can superimpose an acoustic hologram or an ultrasound hologram onto or with an optical hologram, and then you can see and feel an object that doesn't exist, right? Um, and so Bosch has gotten into this technology for, um, you know, they're in the, the electric car vehicle business and um, household appliances, right? And so Facebook has even talked about whether you can actually use the skin to be able to heal. And when you look at brain computer interfaces, this is something we're working on to communicate. We have for a long time. I think we've got a patent history of this. Communications has been one of the big things that we wanted to touch on. So outside of medicine, when you look at scaling, touching on communications and changing the way that individuals communicate with machines and the way they communicate with each other is, is to me, that's the, the thing that's really disruptive. So to summarize on this first part of the talk, um, ultrasonic neuromodulation of activity. Uh, the reason I was awarded a YFA was to stand up to this challenge uh, from, it was a DARPA YFA, is, you know, they look what DARPA does, what they fund are things that are impossible. They convert those things from being impossible to improbable, and then they convert those things from being improbable to inevitable, right? And that's exactly what has happened with Focus Ultrasound. And in fact, there's a, you know, paper published in science, uh, editorial published in science last year talking about the promise of this space, right? And so to be able to see it come from NIH laughed me out the door to they want to fund this every angle they can and not taking a dollar from NIH to get to that point has been very satisfying. Um, so I look forward to seeing where the field goes um, in the future. So neuroengineering devices to scale. So this is a different problem, right? So when you have a transducer that fits on someone's head, you bring them into a clinical environment and you want to focally modulate a part of their brain to treat a disease, and you need neuro navigation that requires a certain amount of space and equipment, right? You can't scale that very easily. And so the other part of the problem that I've been tasked to work on for about a decade was it's how do you scale these technologies, right? Like how do you really touch on and maximize what's called the total addressable um, market? So in 2014, it's kind of like how did the brain mapping approach where everyone wants to map every synapse in the brain and you know DARPA's like well we, we map every synapse in the brain we understand how the brain works like and I just kind of took that tone too I'm like that's just that's pie in the sky right like you can do it in a mouse but what that tells you about human behavior is is you're so far off base like you're you think north stars this direction then it's that direction that's a, that's a matter of opinion okay what I thought would be really impactful was to be able to develop sensors and devices that you can put on people in everyday life in real world environments and start to modulate their nervous system and collect information about their environment, their behavior in that environment, and then use machine learning to make predictions about how the person's behaving, right? And so that was kind of my dream. You, you have to make wearables, right? It has to be wearable, but there's other things that come with something being wearable. So like when you talk to consumers and you talk about brain stimulation devices and enhancing your performance, you show them something like this. This is a product by Halo, the company that's now defunct, it was acquired recently. Um, these spiky, and that's what they call them, the spiky things, right? Like that doesn't scale. That doesn't scale. Because if someone looks at it, you've lost them, right? They need to put it on and be done with it. So that's a really hard lesson to explain. Like the, we learned that just by testing on hundreds of thousands, not hundreds of thousands of people, but hundreds and thousands of, of individuals um, across the years. And so for me, the solution, like in my head was always, it has to be something that's really familiar for people, right? So when we had Think, we had this little patch that people wore on their forehead, right? It's this bright white reflective kind of patch and it, it just looked like Star Trek, which is cool, but it doesn't scale. Right, it doesn't scale. It's a not. It's 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 cool, but that's about it, right? And it does stuff for people, but that's about it, not much. So, headphones. I was always interested in headphones, right? And like making this scale through headphones and this idea of modulating the vagus. And so, when you modulate these peripheral nerves, you're actually activating and modulating the activity of areas of the brainstem, like the locus ceruleus, the dorsal raphe, right? And so, the reticular formation, which is associated with ascending arousal as well as these other nuclei that are associated with kind of like the induction of sleep, right? We wanted to use these tools and develop an architecture that says, look, you have a wireless wearable device that can we transmit signals via Bluetooth to this device. That device is then an electrical nerve stimulator that can be used to modulate 
these areas of the reticular activating system, right? The locus ceruleus, rapid nuclei, peduncle, ponte nuclei that are responsible for ascending arousal control in the brain. So these, the locus ceruleus modulates tone or arousal for about 85% of the brain, right? So you're modulating stress, sympathetic tone, ascending adrenaline, um, if you will. At the same time, you can turn down someone's ability to, to, to be stressed, right? And so we don't, how that exactly works is not really fully understood. Um, we do know that you can use it to modulate attention and learning, as I'll show you in a minute, and you can use it to modulate sleep. Um, and people have shown depression, anxiety, and movement disorders in various uh, other areas. So there's lots of evidence that these, the so functional imaging evidence showing that when you stimulate these nerves that are in the ear, there's, there's five nerves that innervate the ear. Um, when you modulate the vagus nerve or other peripheral nerves, they all kind of work the same. You do activate the locus ceruleus. And so that's what this shows is you get activation of the locus ceruleus, as well as the nucleus of the solitary tract, parabrachial area, um, and then other uh, subthalamic nuclei. So the, um, the effects also can, um, be somewhat nonspecific, right? And so I think that's what people get stuck on. It's like, and, and it's, I think a lot of that has to do with statistical variation and noise in the data, but there's this idea that you have to be exactly on one branch of the vagus nerve in the ear to be able to get these types of effects. And from what we've seen, that doesn't seem to be the case, right? It seems to be pretty much most of the peripheral nerves will give you the same type of response in terms of sensory processing and ascending arousal and attention. Um, People have shown that you can treat depression. We believe that the, the, the next, what you're gonna see next with vagus nerve stimulation are a wave of companies in mental health, anxiety, depression, substance abuse disorder, attention disorders. There was a company a few weeks ago that announced they raised $17 million for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. And again, this has been one of the big targets of the, the invasive bioelectronics industry. And now that non-invasive bioelectronics or non-invasive neurostimulation devices are able to treat those inflammatory autoimmune conditions, I think that you'll see it will start to split, but initially it's gonna be mostly mental health focused. Um, that seems to be where the largest effects are. And it also seems where be where a lot of the need is right now. So problems with scaling it, if you look at what people create in a laboratory, right? They come up with all these solutions to be able to stimulate someone's ear. And so you look at something like this and you say, oh, this is just a standard earbud and that should work fine, you know, just like whatever Jamie's talking about. Well, it doesn't because when you look at this, this has two small metal contacts. And so what you're doing is you're driving all the current. If you have a five milliamp waveform, you're driving all the five milliamps into those two electrode contacts and you're not distributing the electrical current across the surface of the skin, right? And so you have a high current density, right? So you may have five, milli five milliamps per centimeter squared or even more. This is probably like this is probably like 30 milliamps per centimeter squared actually. Um, that high current density causes pain. It's very uncomfortable. It causes a biting sensation, right? And that's why around the edge of the electrode sometimes where you have a high current density in certain experiments like TDCS, it will be uncomfortable for people. Carbon electrodes, they have a high input impedance, right? So if you use carbon fiber electrodes, you have to deliver a lot of voltage to get across this impedance to be able to get a certain current to the skin that makes it very uncomfortable for individuals as well. Physical clips, they don't feel good. This is an electric paper clip, like our electric clothespin kind of clipped to your ear, right? Like, sure, it works on a subject for publication in a paper, but go try to give that to someone to treat their headache. They're like, I'll take the headache, right? Like depending on how severe the headache is, but these are points of scaling. You have to consider the customer, right? Um, servo med, again, this is like a very little clever mechanical design that has a spring built out of this, like, I'm not sure what material this is, probably some kind of delrin, some kind of polymer plastic. But again, you see these metal electrode contacts. This is one of my favorites. I'm sure these are some zinc alloy, like pick up your, your local Ace hardware store, screwed into a Teflon, you know, barely soldered onto a wire. But hey, you clip it on your ear and sure enough, you'll get effects, right? So we went to the anatomy. I went to the anatomy and started looking at the anatomy. And, and when you look at the anatomy, the vagus nerve is highest con its highest concentration in terms of innovation is in the meatus, the external meatus, which is your outer ear canal. And so I was like, look, just put dry electrodes in the ear canal, in the outer ear canal, and turn on the current, right? 
because then you distribute the current across a dry electrode. And so that's what we did. So I filed the IP in 2014, 2015, when I was living in Boston, I bought it back uh, in 2019. Uh, we started working on dry, inter a dry electrode, dry electrode interfaces. Um, and uh, we protected that. And uh, I was interested in sleep, right? Cause I had seen, and I showed this the last time I was at UAB, I had seen like in the lab, and this was like done in, in Boston and in the Prudential Tower, like in private business, but we would bring people in, they would just fall asleep. After like five minutes of stimulation, they would just start to fall asleep. And I was like, that is really fascinating because at that time it was hard to raise money for us. Like we had already raised enough money. We should have done something with that was a management issue that we can talk about another time. Um, but I just wanted to go into a VC room and say, look, I'm just, everyone goes to sleep. If you go to sleep, you're going to write the check, right? We, then we can go do the study because this is the, they, everyone wanted the demonstration, right? They want to think that like they're floating on ether or some kind of like they expect something, right? And it's like when not much happens, you just kind of like, I'm a little more relaxed, but not much. It's hard for them to understand what the impact of that is. Um, they want it to be like Red Bull, it gives you wings, right? Like this is what Silicon Valley wanted. So I just wanted to put people to sleep. Um, so if you go back to the 1970s, there's some papers in cats, like these awake cat preparations that um, a lot of people at UAB are familiar with because a lot of people at UAB have done these types of studies. But what they showed is when you stimulate the vagal aortic arch and the vagus nerve, you can actually induce rapidly and immediately a full cycle of sleep in these cats, right? You just put them to sleep. And so I was like, well, that's crazy, right? Maybe there's a sleep switch, an electronic sleep switch. So if you look at the anatomy, I'm gonna bypass this, I already explained this um, for the sake of time, but the locus ceruleus is the key regulator of sleep, right? You're either, if you look at this flip-flop model of sleep, you're either awake or you're asleep. And it has to do with the tone of your locus ceruleus. And so what happens when you're awake is you have orexin basically modulating the locus ceruleus. And as soon as you have other areas of the brain in the hypothalamus shut down orexin, you can start to tilt the balance and you fall asleep, right? And so if someone has a strong sleep drive, if you can just get them to quiet down and calm down, they'll fall asleep. And so um, this work came out of Think, the company split. I did some work with this company to help them get this marketed. It's now a CE Mark device in Europe for treatment of insomnia um, that I kind of left alone because I didn't have control over all the IP. And then I went and did a, another contract I'll talk about in a minute as we wrap up. At the same time I was working on sleep, my Kilgard's group uh, in Texas had been showing that they could alter um, uh, essentially damaged auditory cortex activity using vagus nerve stimulation. So you could remap the tonotopic representation of auditory tones on the cortex if you paired vagus nerve stimulation with a tone, right? So if you do that, you pair vagus nerve stimulation with a tone several hundred times, you change the, the structural tonotopic representation of those tones on the cortex. And so this was the beginning of what's called DARPA TNT, the Targeted Neuroplasticity Training Program. My company had collapsed and I, I had to fire 55 people, sell my house in Boston. I had an appointment at Arizona State University. I came back to ASU and was awarded two TNT contracts. Um, so we, I brought in two partners. Um, as soon as I heard, I heard TNT language learning. And so I had been doing work for quite some time with InQtel um, and other groups to develop neuromodulation devices with the idea of enhancing language learning. And we had already started to look at Swahili, was this even feasible, possible? And so as soon as I heard TNT language learning, I got on the phone and called someone that I know. And they're like, we can't participate because we helped plan it. And I was like, well, that's no good. And so they eventually got, got permission to participate and we partnered with them. And that was, at the time, it was the Center for Advanced Language Studies, which is now known as ARLIS. It's the Advanced Research Institute for Security um, at the University of Maryland. They were one of my partners and I was to teach them the methods and we did. And then the other partner was, uh, was a prime contract to ASU. And I brought in Usarium, who we had worked with and had a creator with to enhance marksmanship. And then I brought in uh, Andy McKinley and his group at the U US Air Force uh, Research Laboratories. And we had worked with him for quite some time um, on enhancing certain aspects of drone operator performance. This is the anatomy showing that you do indeed have a high degree of vagal innervation in, in the meatus. When we started, we had the solution that we had was an earbud electrode from another company that was a conductive rubber, a carbonized rubber. 
and you had to spray it with saline. And so you can imagine if you're an analyst, I'm like, you need to learn Mandarin a little bit faster, but you have to like stick this wet electrode in your ear, all bets are off. Attention goes out the window, right? So again, it comes down to human factors. How easy can I get someone to use it? And how much can I take away any cognitive load that they put on using that device? Uh, earbud electrodes, put them in your ears, turn it on and forget about it, literally. And that's what worked, right? So that, that worked. Um, so we published a paper showing that it was safe, that this bilateral approach was safe. Um, we showed that you could enhance plasticity with a lot of EEG, hundreds of subjects we ran. It was a heroic effort by my lab at ASU. Um, credit to the people in the lab that conducted the work. I didn't do any of the, the actual hard work. Um, they did. This, you know, this was picked up by ESPN that we were doing this work in terms of enhancing human performance. Uh, this is a combat veteran, and this was actually one of the, to my knowledge, the first use of vagus nerve stimulation as a performance enhancing device in sport. Um, it's interesting. So we basically, this guy, uh, he, was, he, was, he was having a hard time, but uh, we started working with him using EEG neurofeedback devices with some of my colleagues here at ASU and then integrated vagus nerve stimulation with those devices. Um, so the last couple of things here, this is work from uh, our collaborators at the University of Maryland. Uh, they actually showed that using, there were two different approaches. We paired, we designed protocols that would pair the vagus nerve stimulation with the target word. And they, that was called the, 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 the peristem approach. So you're stimulating around the time of a target cue. And then there's another approach that we had called the priming approach where you just modulate for a period of time before the person actually engages in training. And both those conditions were shown to enhance Mandarin learning. And Mandarin is particularly difficult um, because it's a tonal language. These were fun experiments, though. I had a great time collaborating with them. I was working with some other people there, and we were actually, they were teaching ferrets Mandarin, right, using vagus nerve stimulation. So my job was to, like, come up with methods of how to stimulate the, the a ferret's auricular vagus, right, so to learn Mandarin. And so that was pretty fun. Other groups have shown the same thing. Vagus nerve stimulation enhances Mandarin. This is also another TNT performer from a different group, um, Matt Leonard's group. Andy McKinley has now shown that uh, these methods work to enhance uh, search and rescue tasks, vigilance and attention in operators. Um, and so this is the way my company works is we've worked with other industries to be able to scale this. So instead of me being the brand that takes the product to market, I would prefer to be the brand that enables a very large brand to take a product to market because they have all the marketing power, the global distribution footprint, manufacturing, all the things that are hard about delivering a device to a market. Um, and I don't have to recreate that. And so working through a partnership, we did this on uh, developing TAVNS for insomnia. The company was supposed to, my company was supposed to be acquired last June, but COVID hit. We did finish the trial. That was a very interesting learning experience about how to conduct clinical trials in COVID. We got that done. Um, we just found out a couple of weeks ago, we were awarded a contract. Um, it's called SEMI NBMC. It's the Nano Bio Manufacturing Consortium. Um, so this is a special program with, that's run by the Air Force Research Laboratory to create a consortium that's been basically a government uh, procurer of uh, technologies that can help with manufacturing. And so we, it, it took me two years, but two years in working with Incutel and the Miter Corporation and, and SOCOM and others, uh, I proposed this project called BRAIN. I figured everyone, NIH has a brain. I couldn't get them on their brain action. So the DOD would have a brain and this is the brain. It's bolstering resilience, uh, adaptability and intelligence with neurotechnology. And so we will be co-developing and manufacturing devices for the US Air Force to use. Um, and I'm very, very excited about that. It's been a very long road to get to the point to be able to earn uh, the ability to do that. The point is we want to we want to scale. We want BNS for everybody, right? Like again, earbud electrodes, you just put them in your ears and forget about it, right? And that's how you scale it, right? It's not by having something that's hard to use or difficult to use or even painful, right? Or, or just comfortable, you know, not, not comfortable. So that's what we're doing. That's what we've been doing for a long time. This is my hall of fame of people that we've uh, modulated along the year. These are the first prototypes, right? And like, I think one of the lessons learned is like, don't be afraid to prototype. Don't be afraid to let people try your prototype. So the very first functional prototype ever tried on individual outside of my company was on Bill Gates, right? Like literally this was, the first time this thing was used and it wasn't perfect, but he got the idea, 
right? And so that's what you have to do. You have to take something and put it into someone's hands, get the feedback and help them get the idea. Same thing with Jerry Yang, Sergey Brin, and this is President Crow just before I renegotiated an appointment here. Well, made him feel good. <laughs> so every time he sees he's like, you got that device, you'll never forget it, right? So, um, but quick review, what have I talked about today? I've talked uh, about neuromodulation by Focus Ultrasound. It's a platform technology for mechanically interfacing with the brain and peripheral nervous system to high resolution. Um, I've given you examples that neuromodulation by Focus Ultrasound is, provides a lot of therapeutic promise for treating depression, anxiety, pain, Alzheimer's, dementia, movement disorders, autoimmune disorders, um, and others that auricular vagus nerve stimulation induces bottom-up changes in neurophysiological arousal mediated by locus aurelius norepinephrine um, circuits to modulate brain plasticity. And you can use that to induce cognitive effects um, such as produce enhanced outcome in learning. Um, auricular vagus nerve stimulation on the therapeutic side has high promise for treating insomnia, depression, anxiety, pain, tinnitus, addiction, headache, and other autoimmune dysfunction. Um, and then the last point is that auricular vagus nerve stimulation is universally scalable, right, to all individuals. If you think about, like, I look at my children and, and them in school, and I just, like, like, look, my goal has been for seven years, and it's, it's, it's difficult for people to understand this in the school of medicine sometimes, but my goal has been that when a soldier gets off a bus at basic training, they get a set of our earbuds, right, like that. And then from there, it scales across. And when you look at what it can do for them to, you know, help with sleep and other things, I think that, that, that we're now looking at that as a, it, it could become real. So with that, I will thank you, take any questions and open it up for discussion. Thank you, Jamie, that was terrific. Uh, one of the downsides of Zoom seminars is you can't hear the applause, but there is lots of virtual applause, <laughs> clap emojis, people clapping. That was a fantastic talk, so much exciting uh, stuff that you told us about. Um, the first question was posted in the chat. I will read it for you. And then uh, another one just got posted. And then people can also, um, after I read these two questions, um, unmute themselves and ask questions. So the, the first question was about something earlier in your talk where you were talking about just the disruption effect on rumination disorder. The question was, how long would that disruption last? Would it be temporary or or longer lasting for the rumination um, with patients with uh, depression. Yeah, so it, should, it, it, it looks like it lasts days, right? Um, and so what we don't know and what we need to run, this is where we're trying to look at how we run the trial now, is what happens if you treat someone every day for two weeks, right? So if you were to follow like a repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation protocol, would you then produce effects that last longer? What's really interesting about this and what people forget, and when we look at vagus nerve stimulation for like treatment of insomnia, right? When you treat insomnia, it has long lasting effects. It has an acute effect on your sleep, but it has a long lasting effect on your mood, your anxiety, your depression, your inflammation, and all the other things that you associate with health, right? And so it's kind of like trying to understand um, what that order of progression is. So if we start to treat the depression and we get a, a, a initially an acute effect on the rumination, does that then carry over to have some other effect that starts to work on the disease? And that's where it gets complicated. Okay, thank you. Um, there was another question. Christina, you want me to read this or do you want to unmute and I can just unmute. ask? Okay. Um, can you hear me? Um, so great talk. It was really awesome, awesome work. Um, I wanted to know, so, so there are other techniques and devices, you know, TACS, TDCS, that probably have influences on learning. And I'm wondering whether you think that they all work on similar principles yeah. or whether you think they're going to be using different principles. 100%, 100%. So we, we looked at TDCS and TACS and abandoned it really quickly. TDCS, because look, you're delivering two milliamps to the skin and that's most that's the most that someone can tolerate with a DC current, right? And so part of the human factors is making it comfortable. I didn't get into it. That's why we use high frequency stimulation because pain receptors will respond up to about 300 Hertz. You can still modulate nerve activity without activating pain receptors at high frequencies, right? So with TDCS and TACS, I think that like that is a very, look, it's a very interesting science because it's easy but it's a very misunderstood science because of lack of sophistication by a lot of the people in the field, right? 
And they had really crappy finite element models and they had tried to force this idea that the electric field strength produced by a two milliamp current in the, was sufficient to modulate brain activity. When you actually look at it, it doesn't look like it's true. So now if we come to people who have done rational empirically driven science, um, people have used lidocaine. And when you, so they've shown that when you do TDCS or TACS in particular, you can entrain motor activity, right? You basically entrain motor cortex, you entrain, you can record, the entrainment of the motor cortex by doing EMG in the arm. When you paralyze the scalp sensation with lidocaine, that effect's gone, right? What people forget is the entire, your entire head, anywhere you touch on your head is innervated by a trigeminal nerve or some other peripheral nerve, right? That's how, that's why you feel it. So similarly, so, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Well, so so I think it, it is all the same, right? Like even your yeah. dura is innervated by your trigeminal nerve. Yeah. Right? And so, you're affecting peripheral nerves way before the current even gets to the brain. I mean, it's instantaneous, right? But it's, yeah. it's it, it, at least structurally, it's before you get to the brain. Then in principle, it doesn't necessarily matter that you're in the vagus nerve. No, um, you so, could... that is, so, so that is a really good question. DARPA, like people were not satisfied with our explanation because we used to joke that like, you can just stimulate the bottom of the foot, right? Or you can stimulate, so, the visual system. We don't know how much that is true. Yeah, yeah. So we don't know how much that is. True. Well, so yeah. So that is vision, stimulating the visual system at 40 hertz is absolutely sensory. It's sensory modulation, right? Mm -hmm. It's sensory modulation. It's 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 not necessarily entrainment, but it's modulation of sensory activity. And so we know that you can do the same thing with mechanical stimulation. Mm -hmm. You can likely do the same thing with thermal stimulation, right? And so it then becomes a question on the engineering side of like, what device do you want to put on the body? Yeah. And kind of one of the easiest things to do is make an electrode. It's pretty cheap, right? As soon as I have to build a yeah. Peltier device to start to heat something up or cool something off, or I have a CMUT and an ASIC, it gets expensive, right? And so, yeah, it's not a very satisfying answer, but it does look like the TDCS and TACS seem to be mostly mediated by peripheral stimulation because of these experiments where they use lidocaine. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I Thank you. I, I had a question. You showed... Uh, data where you paired the vagal nerve stimulation uh, with words and helped with the learning of language in healthy um, participants. Have you tried or have you thought about, do you think it would work to do something similar, pairing vagal nerve stimulation with uh, help assisting learning in, for example, Alzheimer's patients or other it's memory impaired patients? It's interesting. It, it's very interesting. I don't, I don't know about memory. Um, it's interesting, right? So what Mike Kilgard's group is they were doing it for 10 of this, um, but they started to expand beyond that now, right? And so there are people, there's these, there's devices that actually stimulate the tongue, there are electrical grids that stimulate the tongue. Alzheimer's disease has become a target for them. So I think like, look, it's plasticity at the end of the day, right? And so if someone has lost their capacity to exhibit plasticity, it might be very difficult. But if they still have the capacity to exhibit plasticity, then you should be able to jumpstart it or enhance what's left, right? Does that make sense? Yes. So restoring plasticity is like a completely different thing, I think, because I think, unfortunately, in some conditions, right, especially in like late stage Alzheimer's disease, I'm not sure that you can get the plasticity going again. But if they still had some, if patients some still patients, had some plasticity yeah. capacity. Yeah. So stroke rehab has become an interesting area too with aphasia, right? Like pairing stimulation with words and aphasia. And I think that some of the group at Texas has started to do that too, um, you know, because it's, again, it's because it's safe, right? And it has a high inherent safety. It opens up so much that you can do in terms of research, right? And so we always drew the line in the sand of saying, look, you never penetrate the skin. That's rule number one. As soon as you penetrate the skin, you're no longer a minimally invasive or a, a low invasive device, right? And so because we like dealing with the stratum corneum, there's a lot of uh, resistance with the stratum corneum, the dead skins on the cells, dead skin on the surface. And so we thought about using carbon nanofibers, right? Just to penetrate just the very superficial layer of the stratum corneum, because then your input resistance goes down way low, right? And so now my power requirements are very low, but it, it, you penetrate the skin, right? So, and, 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 um, keeping it in that space where it's truly non-invasive allows you to do so much, right? Like stroke rehab, movement disorders. We've looked at cerebral palsy and we thought about even with cerebral palsy, if you could pair it with like constraint-induced therapy, right? Could it, like, would you enhance 
the, the benefit of constraint induced therapies if you had vagus nerve stimulation paired with some of the tasks that they were doing. That relates to a question, another question typed in the chat. What about children with learning disorders from birth? CP. I mean, CP is not a learning disorder, right? But that's one of, we look at CP as a, a, a devastating injury, right? That happens at birth because of a birth related event. And um, so with learning disorders, it, it's tough, right? Um, we don't know, but we, what we do know is that people have gotten these methods approved. So there's a, a spin out from UCLA, NeuroSigma, and they have an approval for trigeminal nerve stimulation to treat ADHD in juveniles, right? And so as, as safety data accumulated, people became more comfortable doing it in children. And so I think we're just now at the part, Lynn, where people will start to do it in infants. When you look at Mark George has a very interesting story out of Medical University of South Carolina where premature babies have a lack of a suckling reflex. And so he started pairing vagus nerve stimulation in the NICU with suckling and he enhanced their oral motor reflex and ability to, uh, to, to suckle, right? And so it, it's not a learning disorder per se, but it's, it's evidence that it's safe in children and you can enhance this plasticity. Think about it as just a, attention allocation, right? Cognitive resources. It's like you're just adding something else to increase the salience of whatever you're doing or decrease the salience of whatever you're doing. Well, I would love for us to keep talking and asking questions, but our time is, is sort of up. And I uh, want to thank you again, Jamie, for a fantastic seminar, really exciting work. Thank you for, for coming and speaking in our seminar series. Thank you, all of you, for attending. Um, it was great turnout. and. Uh, Great, great talk. So thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jimmy. Great job, Liz. Stay safe. Thanks.